and now we are going to talk about methods of gaining space. So, here we are going to talk about different methods of gaining space whether it is removable, fixed, screw type those kind of things. First one is which of the following is a non-invasive method of gaining space? It is expansion and distillation. Slenderization is nothing but proximal stripping. Extraction is obviously invasive. Uh, expansion with extraction if you take both together they are invasive. So, expansion and distillation are the two non-invasive methods. So, these are the things. Now, uh, any kind of invasive method is will usually be a non-reversible method of gaining space. So, when you talk about proximal stripping, we talk about extractions, once the tooth material or the tooth is gone, it is gone, you cannot get that back. But and slenderization is also known by different names like reproximation, proximal stripping, pro proximal slicing or proximal disking. These are the different synonyms or other names for slenderization. We usually use the term proximal stripping or reproximation little more commonly. A patient has a unilateral, unilateral posterior cross bite because of functional shift of the mandible. So, the kind of treatment that can be given to this patient is bilateral expansion of the arch. Now, you would probably say why would we do a bilateral expansion? Why not a unilateral expansion in the side where there is unilateral cross bite? Usually unilateral expansion is not possible. It is also very difficult and secondly when there is a cross bite associated with a functional shift of the mandible, it is advisable to do a uh, expansion bilaterally. So, a functional shift may be again the centriculation and centric occlusion are not coinciding because there is a shift in the mandible. So, for whatever reason there is, it is always advisable to do a bilateral expansion. A true unilateral cross bite occurs when the patient exhibits no kind of functional shift. So, again let us not go into the centric relation and centric occlusion. The main problem is the cross bite and the functional shift. So, when these two are there, we have to go in for a bilateral expansion. Now, which is a new slow type of palatal expander. Now, most of you might not be familiar with expanders, palatal expander, slow, fast, new, old. So, uh, these words or rather these expanders which you can see over here A, B, C, D, these must be something you must have never heard of. So, uh, if you remember just a couple of them, for example, this one which we are discussing right now, new type of slow palatal expander. If you can just remember that it is called a NITA expander, it should be enough. Now, NITA expander is basically an expander in which you use a NITA wire. Now, this diagram does not show the NITA expander, it shows actually a hyrax. So, do not uh, stress on the diagrams, the diagrams you can get anywhere else, but the NITA expander is a palatal expander which is a slightly newer version and causes a slow amount of expansion. Now, Arnott developed a, a tandem loop NITI temperature activated palatal expander. So, this makes the use of the high flexibility of NITI wires which produces gentle expansion forces in the range of 300 grams. Tandem loop basically means two loops together in tandem, that means together. And NITI as you know is nickel titanium, temperature activated means once you put it into the mouth and the temperature of the mouth causes activation of the NITI, there is a certain amount of expansion that is taking place. So, these NITI expanders are available in 8 different intermolar widths according to the specific intermolar width of the patient itself and it ranges from 26 millimeters to 47 millimeters and it generates a maximum force of around 300 grams. So, there are newer appliances which are called the fan expander, butterfly expander, uh, there is a spider screw etcetera. Now, uh, if you go into the, you do not really have to go into the details of how it is 
designed and who designed it and what are the components etc because you are not really expected to know all those things but if you know these names and you know that it is an expander it is used for this purpose it um, uh, generates this kind of force that should be good enough because anything more than that will always be confusing now this is not a nita expander but it is a kind of an expander so basically when you expand and activate it and put in the mouth and the temperature raises automatically there is some amount of expansion taking place in the patient's mouth now hyrax you all will be kind of familiar with uh, hyrax is mainly used in maxillary expansion so answer is c rme which of the following is a contraindication of rme it is basically patients with a vertical growth pattern now why does that happen because there is also some amount of extrusion of the posterior teeth and opening of the sutures therefore this might actually increase the vertical height the lower facial height might actually increase so it is not beneficial in patients who already have a increased lower facial height or a vertical tendency now rma should be initiated prior to the ossification of the mid palatal suture that is up to around 16 years of age <clears throat> the other indications of rme are posterior crossbite whether it is unilateral or bilateral and uh, class 3 malocclusions basically because when the maxilla is constricted and face mask therapy rme is used with the face mask in a maxillary sagittal deficiency cases and basically it loses the circummaxillary sutures and therefore the maxilla moves forward when there is a constricted maxillary arch and also in patients who have a cleft lip and palate with a collapsed arch so basically anything in which the maxillary arch is collapsed or small and it needs to be expanded now uh, it is also used in tooth size arch length discrepancies means the the tooth uh, the arch length or the arch width is less and the tooth size is more so <clears throat> all these things are basically related to the maxilla and the maxillary width now here gray and brogans they uh, said that rme can also be used for uh, when the nasal airway is a little less sometimes also for septal deformities or a nasal stenosis why because apart from opening up the mid palatal sutures it also loses up the circummaxillary sutures which includes one of the nasal sutures also so uh, maybe not this might not be a treatment modality for conditions like nasal stenosis etc but it also causes uh, a better uh, you know way of breathing suppose there is some amount of blockage but this is not a treatment option for that it is just another thing that happens along with expansion of the maxilla now the contraindications are skeletal asymmetry of the maxilla or mandible adults with severe anterior posterior and vertical skeletal discrepancies Uh, patients who have a single tooth crossbite they probably are not candidates for rme patients with already existing open bite this might usually make it worse patients with uh, increased mandibular plane angle that means a vertical growth pattern and also patients who are not cooperative who have very bad oral hygiene and who cannot do the activation properly these are the absolute contraindications the relative contraindications are the in cases where the mid palatal suture has already ossified in such cases you cannot use a rme but you can do other surgical procedures also in cases where the posterior teeth are utilized as uh, anchors so we would not like to shift them and finally where the occlusion is good and the interdigitations between the teeth are also good a 12 year old boy was subject to rme for the correction of bilateral posterior crossbite the maximum separation will occur between the two central incisors so what you usually see is once you start activating the rme you will see a, a fan kind of expansion happening the maximum expansion will happen in the anterior region and the minimum expansion will happen at the posterior region so it will follow a v shaped or a fan shaped pattern with the widest area in the anterior region and the narrowest in the posterior region so this is what happens you will see a midline diastema and usually the central tend to flare in opposite directions but within some time because of the traction of the fibers the gingival fibers the maxillary central incisors come back into contact 
<coughs> so this is what I had already discussed previously. Typically RME is done with a jack screw that is activated at the rate of 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter per day. Now we will come to the activation schedule a little later. So right now just remember it is around 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter per day on average. An increase in maxillary width up to 10 millimeters can be achieved by RME and uh, this is the activation schedule. This is only by TIMS. So TIMS says that usually it is done 0 0.5 millimeters per day. For patients up to the age of 15 years of age, basically before the ossification of the mid palatal suture has happened, you can do a 90 degree rotation in the morning and in the evening. So 90 degree rotation means if you do it uh, twice, it comes up to around the same time, around 1 millimeter per day. Whereas if uh, above the age of 16 is over the age of 15, Tim's recommended 45 degree activation four times in a day for four to five days and then later on one turn per day till the desired expansion is achieved. So since beyond 15 years the mid palatal suture is already ossified, the amount of activation if you see in total will remain the same but increase instead of doing it 90 degrees two times, we do it 45 degree four times. So it comes up to the same thing. But this amount is done only for four to five days and then later on it reduces to only one turn till the desired expansion is achieved. So in patients where the mid palatal suture is ossified, the degree of aggressiveness of the activation is reduced. So below 15 years, one quarter turn morning and evening, above 15, half a quarter turn four times a day. It comes up to the same. There is a schedule by Zimmering and Isaacson also. In young growing patients, they recommend two turns, that is two millimeters per day, double the amount that Tim suggests each day for four to five days and then later on one turn per day till the desired expansion is achieved. In case of non-growing patients, they recommend two turns each day for first two days, one turn per day for the next five days and one turn every alternate day till the desired expansion is achieved. So this is the schedule by Zimmering and Isaacson. So it is uh, slightly different when you consider both of them. RMA was carried out to treat a severe maxillary crossbite. In this case, the ratio of skeletal to dental expansion obtained will be 4 is to 1. Now, why is that so? Because when once a suture opens, there can be 10 millimeter of expansion in two weeks at the rate of 0.5 millimeters to 1 millimeter per day. So, there might be only 8 millimeters of skeletal expansion and only 2 millimeters of tooth movement. <clears throat> so when you take this ratio, so out of 10 millimeters of expansion, 8 is for skeletal and 2 is for dental. So when you take that ratio 8 is to 2, it comes up to 4 is to 1 because some amount of dental expansion also takes place along with skeletal. But because of the bone refilling and relapse, see once you finish expansion and once there is a stationary period where you do not activate it anymore and you remove the appliance. There is some amount of relapse that happens and the maxilla or the maxillary bone actually comes back slightly. There is always a relapse happening in every case where you try to alter the basic structure. So finally the final ratio after a couple of months after the whole activation is over will be 1 is to 1. So earlier it was 4 is to 1 and then later on it goes down to 1 is to 1. So it depends on the timing of the activation and the expansion that they are talking about we will see the relapse or rather the ratio of the skeletal to dental expansion. Typically RME is done with a jack screw, again it's the same thing. Uh, appliance which brings about orthopedic movements in children and orthodontic movements in adults is a quad helix. Now a quad helix again is a type of an expander, okay. So uh, this it brings about orthopedic movements in children again because the if you use the same force in a child compared to an adult, obviously we take the size of the maxilla, we take the number of teeth, the, the, the size of the teeth and the age and the suture etc. So even that amount of force causes a very large amount of change and movement. So it almost causes an orthopedic kind of a reaction in children rather than in adults. Arch length, la, length discrepancy more than 10 millimeters must require extraction in treating class 1 malocclusion with crowding. Here when you talk about tooth size arch length discrepancies, uh, 
cases where there is mild crowding that means if the discrepancy is 1 to 3 millimeters according to Bishara or 4 millimeters according to profit, you can easily treat it with a non-extraction kind of a way. Where there is moderate crowding means 5 mm or 5 to 9 mm, you can decide to go for either extraction or non-extraction. Usually in this case the second premolars are extracted and in severe crowding cases usually we extract the first premolar. So again this is the same thing, more than 10 millimeters we advocate extraction. Which of the following permanent teeth is least extracted for orthodontic tooth movement? It is the canines uh, for a lot of reasons because of aesthetic purposes mainly and also because the canines form the, they are the cornerstones for the mouth. So, when the canines are absent, usually the arch flattens out a little bit. The canines almost give the kind of the shape to the arch. So, if they are absent, the arch no longer becomes the curved shape that it usually is. Removal of second molars in preference is indicated when there is a Meyer class 2 division 1. Why? So that we can use that extraction space for the second molar to distalize 6 and 5 and 4 without actually you know extracting the first molars. So, this is another method of uh, treating a class 2 division 1 patient by extracting the second molars. Which of the following appliances is not a maxillary distalizing appliance? It is a lip bumper. Now, lip bumpers are mainly used in the lower arch and they are used uh, for many reasons they are mainly myofunctional appliances. Now, we will come to the Jones, Jig, Pendulum plants and all these things later on. Right now, uh, we will only concentrate on the lip bumper. So, lip bumper is mainly a uh, muscle or other appliance to alter muscle activity, especially in the lower jaw. The counterpart of lip bumper in the maxillary arch is called the Denholz appliance. So, now this is the classification of uh, extraoral and intraoral distalizing appliances. Ye online hai kya? Kyunki questions koi aara hai nahi hai. But fir bhi chal raha hai na? Okay. So there are two types of distalizing appliances. There are intraoral and extraoral. In the intramaxillary, or rather intraoral, there is uh, a removal and a fixed one. The removal one consists of a Schwartz plate, sagittal appliance, and a lip bumper which is removable. And the fixed one consists of Jones jig, open coil springs, pendulum appliance, and etc. Whereas the intermaxillary ones, that means which go between the maxilla and mandible, they are Jasper jumper, which is flexible, herbst, and intraoral magnets. We come back to Hyrax again. An activation of 90 degrees creates around 250 grams of a distal force on the molars. So, this is a pendulum appliance. A pendulum appliance is made of a TMA wire and it produces around 200 to 250 grams of force for every 90 degree activation. All of the following are indications of proximal stripping except one which is a contraindication. The contraindication is large teeth, young teeth with large pulp chambers and that are caries prone. Now, the problem with doing proximal stripping in young teeth are that because they have large pulp chambers, so if the tooth is this big, the major amount of uh, area that is inside is the pulp. So, even if we try to do little amount of approximation, there are chances that we might expose the pulp. Therefore, we do not do it. And secondly, they are more caries prone. Therefore, if we do reproximation, that caries susceptibility might increase. So, we try to avoid it in young patients. Proximal stripping was introduced by Ballard in 1944 and uh, again we discussed the contraindications. Approximately 0.5 ml of enamel is re reduced from the mesial and the distal surfaces giving a maximum of 4 millimeters of additional spaces in the anterior part means when you take lateral, central, central, lateral all four of them, four of them together. So, more than 50 percent of the enamel thickness is not recommended to be removed. Which of the following appliances is not used for slow expansion? It is Hyrax. Hyrax is one of the most commonest uh, appliances used for rapid expansion. 
Emerson C. Angel is considered, this is not Angel, this is Angel, he is considered the father of RME. Basically, uh, arch expansion appliances are two types, there are slow and there are rapid ones. The slow appliances can be divided into screw type or spring type. The screw type ones are jack screw and Schwartz appliance. The Schwartz appliance is used in the mandible. The spring type is used the coffin spring and the quad helix and the NITA expander which we discussed previously. So these can be mainly fixed or removable. Now removable uh, uh, appliances usually incorporate a jack screw. A jack screw is nothing but a tiny screw which you add between the plates of a removable appliance. Uh, now this is another classification of the uh, expansion appliances. It can be removable, it can be fixed tooth and tissue bond or it can be fixed tooth bond, three types. Removable appliances incorporate jack screw, uh, fixed tooth and tissue bond appliances, uh, a split acrylic plate is present and it can be of the Derek Swiller or the hash type appliance. The screw is different in both the types. And in a fixed tooth bond appliance, there is a no acrylic plate. There is a Isaacson type which uses the mini expander. Now mini is actually an acronym. It is actually uh, University of Minnesota. That is why they call it mini expander. Hyrax which is an acronym for hygienic rapid expansion and there is a Biederman type of expander. So all these three have different types of expansion screws. So Hyrax might be banded or it might be bonded but the short appliance is used in the mandibular arch. Then there is quad helix. Quad helix again it widens the upper arch it is used for expansion. This is the diagram of the quad helix. Both the coffin spring and quad helix are used for palatal expansion but obviously the quad helix is much more faster. Here there is quad means four. So therefore there are four helices, two in the anterior, two in the posterior region. A wire of 1 mm thickness is used and it is usually made of LG alloy that is cobalt chromium alloy. A coffin spring was made, it was designed by Walter Coffin. It is a removable appliance and it causes slow expansion and it is made of a omega shaped wire of 1.2 millimeter thickness which is placed in the mid palatal region. Quad helix and coffin spring are slow expansion appliances although quad helix is a little faster. In children they bring about orthopedic movement which we discussed earlier. The mid palatal suture is likely to open at which age? The answer is around 13. RMA should be initiated prior to the ossification of mid palatal suture because that is the time where actually you will be able to see the results. Now usually it, uh, the mid palatal suture closes around 16 years of age in girls and 18 years in boys according to Melson. Expansion screws used in treatment of cross spites produce around 0.2 millimeter expansion per quarter turn which is equal to the width of the PDL ligament. Now usually they say that this is the amount that is ideal because more than this would cause a lot of pain and discomfort to the patient. The screws are made to open 0.18 or 0.2 millimeters when turned through 90 degrees. This is either less than or equal to the width of the PDL and this is the pitch of the screw. The pitch is the amount of separation of the two parts of the basal plate for every turn of expansion screw. So it is about 0.8 millimeters. That means that when there is an appliance which has a screw in between. So when you do one whole round of activation, that means you turn it 90 degrees, 90 degrees and make it the whole 380 degrees. That means the, uh, the point at which it comes back to the normal position. When you see the separation of the base plates, it is around 0.8 millimeters. So that is the pitch of the screw. And it was Schwartz mainly who described the expansion of the screws. A substantial increase in the maxillary width is usually obtained by placing a sutural expansion fixed appliance. Basically none of these L's would other appliances would actually cause a sufficient force to separate the mid palatal suture or to cause any amount of expansion rather than an expansion appliance. The ratio of the skeletodental expansion after RME is 
D. Like was described earlier, if it is during, it is 4 is to 1. If it is after, that means 2 3 months later, it goes down to 1 is to 1. So, this is a chart showing a uh, rapid expansion as compared to slow expansion. In rapid expansion, it is mainly skeletal as compared to dental alveolar. The ratio is 1 is to 1, skeletal and in dental. After the RME uh, phase is over, and in slow, it is usually 1 is to 4 after the expansion is over, but sometimes according to some authors like profit, it is 1 is to 1. In rapid, it is the rate of expansion is 0 0.5 to 1 millimeters per day. It is the same as slow. In rapid, the intercanine width increases 0 0.65 times. In slow, it increases 0 0.6 times. In the rapid, the frequency of activation is more. It is every day. And in slow, it is slightly less. In rapid, the force generator is, it is around 10 to 20 pounds. In slow, it is just around 2 to 4 pounds, so much lesser. Question number 21 is, this is a very uh, general question. The question is a substantial increase in the width is obtained by placing what? A lingual arch wire, obviously that does not cause any expansion. A, a sutural expansion fixed appliance, this is nothing but a either RME or a slow expansion device. Posterior intermaxillary cross elastics, they do not cause any expansion. And finally, face bow with the expanded inner bow, they also do not cause expansion. This is again a trick question, it is just to understand whether you uh, figure out the what are they actually asking in the question. So, it is in fact the answer itself is given in the question. Increase in the maxillary width is obtained by obviously an expansion type of an appliance. That should answer Priya's question I think. So, coming back to the differences in RME, the rapid maxillary expansion, the treatment is completed in 2 to 3 weeks, but the retention period has to be continued for 3 months after that. Again, that is to avoid or decrease the amount of relapse that is taking place. The results are little less stable because obviously the expansion rate and the amount is so large that there will be some amount of relapse taking place. In the slow parallel expansion, it might take a very long time, 2 to 5 months, but since it is slow and steady wins the race kind of a thing, so the results are more stable. So, if you want something fast, you go in for rapid. If you want something slow, you can go in for slow. But again, the uh, uh, the pros and cons have to be weighed accordingly and then decided. A slow expansion was carried out with a jack screw at the rate of one quarter turn, that is 0.25 millimeters to treat a maxillary cross bite. The ratio again is 1 is to 1, expected to be. First, is expected to be is the keyword and slow expansion is also the keyword. As was described previously, it is 1 is to 1 as described by profit. <clears throat> so, basically after the whole period of expansion is over, whether it is rapid or it is slow, ultimately the ratio comes down to 1 is to 1. A distinctive clinical manifestation of RME is a midline diastema. As discussed previously, the fan shape expansion is taking place. The widest portion is in the anterior region, the uh, narrowest portion in the posterior region. But this closes down again because of the activity of the gingival fibers. So, the palatal place after the expansion should be retained for at least 3 to 6 months so as to avoid relapse. Mandibular expansion appliances act by arch expansion by tipping of the teeth. See, usually mandible is a much more um, compact and sturdy bone rather than the maxilla. Maxilla is much more pliable than the mandible. Therefore, uh, expansion in the maxilla is much easier than the mandible. So, when we talk about expansion in the mandible, uh, not much of skeletal expansion is possible. Usually, more of dental alveolar happens. So, when we talk about the mandibular expansion appliance, it usually happens by slight tipping of the teeth rather than the actual expansion of the arch. So, a good uh, example of the mandibular expansion appliance is the Schwartz appliance. It is activated once a week and it produces an expansion about 0.25 mm in the midline. 
uh, this is a maxillary Schwartz appliance, but the actual Schwartz appliance is in the mandibular arch. It is indicated in uh, early mixed dentition cases where there is mild to moderate crowding and it, uh, there is significant lingual tipping of the posterior dentition. So basically in case of a collapsed ma uh, mandibular arch. Extraction of all permanent first molars is called Wilkinson's extraction. There are many reasons why this is done. One of them is because uh, by the age of uh, around 8 when all these first molars they are uh, erupted in the first the oral cavity, they are very susceptible to caries. Therefore, as a therapeutic method, we usually remove the first molars. Now, there is something called compensatory uh, and balance extraction. When the extraction of the same tooth, like suppose 6, happens in the opposing quadrant or an opposing side of the arch following loss of one permanent teeth on either side of the either arches, they are called compensatory or balanced extraction. The teeth commonly extracted for orthodontic purposes are mainly first premolars and the least extracted ones are the anteriors that is the canines and the maxillary anteriors. A boy aged 14 comes with a class 1 malocclusion, moderate crowding in upper and lower anteriors, primary canines retained and the radiographs show that the permanent canines are erupting. So what do we do? The, the preferred mode of treatment is you extract the C's that is the dextrous canines, the uh, first premolars upper and lower and maintain space for the eruption of the upper permanent canines. Since there is already moderate crowding, so we would recommend extraction of first premolars and since there is a retained deciduous canine and the permanent canine is erupting, we can remove the deciduous canines and help the permanent canines to erupt. Which of the following indicates extraction of upper, I think anteriors is the word. The answer is when the prognosis is poor. So when a patient comes to you who is periodontally compromised, that means who has, uh, whose anterior teeth are such that there is a lot of root resorption, uh, the bony support is not there, the periodontally patient is weak, the teeth are mobile or there is a uh, lot of gingival recession. We know that when we apply a force to this tooth, there the mobility is going to increase and ultimately it might become so mobile that the tooth might actually come out. So in these cases where the prognosis is already poor, in fact bad to poor, we advocate extracting such teeth so as to not complicate matters any further. So when there is already a tooth with bad prognosis, we might as well extract those. So that rarely occurs in the anterior teeth. Now next is a pendulum appliance. A pendulum appliance, uh, the shape is somewhat that of a pendulum. It is an intraoral appliance for the distalization of molars. Again it is used in the maxillary arch. Now distalization means moving the teeth distally. Can be done by various methods, intraoral and extraoral methods. Extraoral can be through headgears and intraoral can be because of uh, appliances like magnets, coil springs, Jones jig, sagittal appliance. So you need to just know the names of these appliances which are used for intraoral methods because extraoral already there is just one headgear that is it. You just need to know about intraoral methods just remember the names. That is so the end of methods of gaining space.